Fora TV. The world is thinking. You know, as I was thinking about this, I, I remembered a comment made by a good friend of mine, Brendan Gill, and he said, television, half Greek, half Latin, no good could possibly come from it. <laughs> and I think Brendan was, was kidding, but let's face it, most of the rest of, this, of us in this room for most of our lives have spent our time sneering at analog television. I mean, university intelligentsia at places like Berkeley and Stanford and elsewhere. And where I went to college, though, though I do remember in sophomore year, people fighting in the commons room between watching Star Trek and I forget what the other thing was. <laughs> so for the last couple of decades, netizens have been in agreement. They've sneered at television and said, ah, this is a waste of time. You know, this is awful. We've got to build something new on the internet. And here we are at the moment of TV's passing, and we have discovered our newfound sentimentality for all things analog. <laughs> which is a little odd because we've been trying to make television digital for a very long time. <laughs> Hobbyists and consumers have been trying to do this sort of thing with Atari and, and, and so on. So the question to ask is, what is it that we really miss? Is, is this regret for analogs passing really a proxy for something else? And, and I suspect it may be a proxy for the sense that the digitization of television may just be profoundly wrong-headed, especially compared to what's going on on the internet in general and the web in particular. But first, go back in time 60 years ago, and you think of the birth of television. Now, Bruce is gonna go further into the past, but I go back to the early 1950s when TV started to take off, and that was the period that once upon a time, television was like the web is today. A period of wild experimentation. <laughs> Entrepreneurs with shoestring budgets, big ideas, and very little adult supervision trying to do all sorts of crazy things. This, of course, is the famous first interactive television show, Winky Dink and You, Winky Dink and Me. It had a book <laughs> spin-off line, and, and, uh, and you, you put an acetate sheet on the screen, and you, you drew in things to help save Winky. It was actually a big success, even though as, as interactivity, it was a little dissatisfying by our standards. It was on the air from 53 to 57, and then abruptly pulled off the air, not because people weren't interested, but parents suddenly realized their children were placing their heads two feet away from a very poorly screened cathode ray tube. <laughs> this individual is actually a member of the California State Assembly, uh, and part of the reason why we don't have a budget. Um, <laughs> but it wasn't just that. We, we very, from the very start, tried to make analog TV uh, interactive. The, in addition to Winky Dink and the like, we had the uh, television remotes, the Zenith Flashomatic, my favorite device, the first, inner, uh, first uh, TV remote that it actually didn't work. It was sort of like the web, and, and its successor, the Space Commander, which did. So we kept trying to make TV more and more interactive. That was a period when TV was new, and it was entrepreneurial. And a funny thing happened in the early 60s. TV grew up. You know, it grew up, started growing up in the 60s, and in the last decade or so, it grew old. I mean, think about the ads that you see on television today. They're aimed at people over 70. Um, but it grew up in the 60s with color TV. And that con need to convert to color cameras and color equipment was what sort of squeezed the solo entrepreneur, the crazy ideas out of, out of television. And it got sort of more and more the land of the suits and the adult supervision. And, and, and occasionally, wacky things managed to find their way in. Um, but for the most part, it became more and more established. TV today, however, in my opinion, isn't dead. It simply fled to the internet. Think about what happened over the last couple of years. It was, what, four years ago, five years ago that we had the first talk show in cyberspace, Layman Lacadamian and, and This Spartan Life, which is the only talk show I've ever watched where you know, one time the guest got shot and killed um, before finishing the interview. Um, and then, of course, more recently, 
just like the 1950s when things came out of nowhere and took off like a rocket, we have Dr. Horrible's sing-along blog. Who knew Do Doogie Howser could sing? And it's been a huge, huge success. Uh, it's now on a DVD. And, and then, of course, we have Hulu, which, you know, is sort of the hottest thing in Hollywood at the moment. This is what, you know, all the, the sweetie, sweetie, baby, baby, have your girl call my girl, let's do lunch types are all buzzing about. And television really has fled to the web. So TV is alive, it just happens to be digital, which raises a really interesting question. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing digital TV? And it is better than analog without a doubt in some ways. More channels, more quality, the opportunity for new kinds of experiences. But I don't know about you, I cannot quite escape the sense that maybe digital television is a colossal oxymoron. In the same way that HD, DVD, and Blu-ray, you know, and everybody fought the big battle, and then the battle was over, and basically consumers said, eh, we'd rather watch it on the internet, you know? And so the poor consumer electronics companies are all dressed up with nowhere to go or rather nobody to sell to. Now, it's not a foregone conclusion, but you do have that sense that digital TV is just a little corporate and a little square. It's controlled by the suits, not controlled by the wacky folks who are doing the wonderful things on the internet. So I think we actually, getting back to the main point, we've got to examine why we care about analog. And do we care about analog or do we care about television. Now, there's a couple of things we should care about. One thing that everybody in this room should care about is the laggards, the people who have not been able to make the conversion to digital. And they're probably in your neighborhoods. And one thing I suggest you do when you go home after this is over is look around. The, you know, the older, the little old lady who watches soap operas in her house and she's got a 20-year-old television, and she either doesn't have a converter or she has one and she doesn't know how to fiddle with the digital uh, antennas. You know, unlike old-fashioned old TVs where you got snow if you had bad reception, with digital you get a digital cliff and there's no signal. We should all be looking out for our neighbors <laughs> and helping people make that transition because there are a lot of people, a lot of laggards, where TV is important in their lives and, you know, they're not geeks like us. And, you know, I, I, I tried to suggest that amateur radio clubs should go out and do this as, as well. But we also need to examine what we care about. Is it TV or is it digital? And maybe it's a different kind of analog than the analog we're losing. Because I actually think this is not about bits versus waves. It's about freedom. It's not about technology, it may be about privacy. Digital TV does one thing and it allows you to encrypt, it allows you to charge. So it's in some ways an end of a commons. Uh, and there are other technologies, other wireless technologies out there that have been analog that are going to digital and that may be a problem. You know, devices like this, this is state of the art in police scanners. This is a technical crowd. I'm sure somebody here has an AOR communications receiver. When our police messaging goes digital, they can encrypt it and we can't listen. And that may be a problem because we need to watch Big Brother. And when Big Brother can shut the public out and nobody can listen, that may be a great social ill. It's not the freedom to watch. It's the freedom to watch back as this graffito that I found in, you know, up in Toronto some years ago. This is what we must focus on, in my opinion. This is the part of digital that I think we'll miss. But I digress. Tonight is a, is a wake and it's a time of celebration and, and recognizing, passing. So let us, as we go out and have drinks, celebrate analog television's decades of goofy gifts to us all, like these. <laughs> Show of hands, how many people remember the apple cobbler under the little aluminum hat? And if you ate it too soon, it was like molten lava in your mouth. Or the Brady Bunch. 
And who could possibly forget Andy Williams' Christmas special? And that, of course, that icon of 20th century telemarketing, Ron Papil and the Vegematic. None of this could have been possible without the wild inventors of the early analog age. But meanwhile, it's also important to keep in mind, analog TV is not dead. In fact, it's immortal. We started sending this stuff out into space decades ago. We started by bouncing it off the Echo satellite, which is why we all have Mylar, and it gets scale. That's a guy down at the bottom there. This was the biggest government beach ball. This was before Proxmire. <laughs> bouncing it off Echo, and by 1962, we were beaming it and bouncing it, relaying it off the Telstar satellite. TV is forever. And, you know, Teilhard de Chardin, if he was here, would instantly recognize this as a a 60 light year in diameter newosphere moving out at the speed of light. You know, television cross, we have, we have 32 star systems within 15 light years, 150, 133 stars visible in 50 light years. This is a view of the 60 light years around us. And when I Love Lucy went on air in 1951, and it started passing outward. Now just think about which stars it's gone past. By 1955, Lucy had passed Alpha Centauri, the same year that Roy Kroc founded McDonald's. By 1957, six years later, it was going past Barnard's star, just when Whammo invented the Frisbee. Fifteen years later, 1966, the Vietnam War, it crossed Altair, and of course, that was the same year that the first pirate radio station anchored off the coast of Britain. And 40 years before we discovered planets around Gliese 876, television passed those planets that may perhaps be habitable. So, you know, we've discovered approximately 200 extrasolar planets so far, but maybe they discovered us first. <laughs> And they're sitting out there watching reruns of Gilligan's Island or laughing. And now television is approaching the Hyades cluster. And who knows? Who knows what alien presences are wondering about who in the world did this stuff? So one wonders, who is watching Andy Williams even as we speak? Who is watching us? But also perhaps, we weren't the only ones to invent analog television. So maybe we shouldn't recycle our television sets just yet. <laughs> Instead, perhaps we should aim our rabbit ears at a little steeper angle and get out some aluminum foil and make a parabolic dish and aim it at the sky because who knows what signals are headed our way. Thank you. <laughs>